The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, welcome to the Stoa. My name is Aaron Rogerson. I'm here with Alyssa Polizzi. Today is the fifth event in the Shadowplay Speaker Series, which is a collection of discussions with the extended Jungian community and beyond, uh, where we hope to explore a wide range of topics regarding the shadow in all its forms and manifestations. Today, we are joined by Lubomir Arsov, artist, philosopher, and creator of the amazing short film, In Shadow, which you can find on YouTube. If you haven't found it already, please watch it. So today we'll be having a discussion with Lubo for about 30 minutes. That'll be followed by an audience Q&A. So please throw your questions for Lubomir in the chat and we'll call on you to ask the question during the Q&A portion of the session. This is gonna be recorded and posted on YouTube. So if you don't wanna be on camera or have your voice captured, just communicate that in the chat and we'll read your question for you. And because we're recording this for YouTube today, we ask that you please turn off your video during the discussion and we'll bring back audience video for the Q&A portion of the session. So please turn off your video. Thank you all very much. All right, so let's get started. Hello, Lubo. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Alyssa. Thank you and Aaron for having me. Um, and I, I really look forward to discussing and unfolding this topic with all of you here. Uh, it's it's been it's a nascent topic within my mind, and perhaps it's occurred to others. But um, uh, yeah, I'd love to deep deeper dive deeper into it. Awesome. So this speaker series is focused on the shadow, and just for anyone who's joining us today who may be unfamiliar with the concept, you know, how would you des describe the shadow in your own words and the themes around the shadow you're most interested in? Yeah, so um, I'm not a Jungian and, and I approach the shadow through my own experience of digging deep into myself and mostly through contrasting it with what it is not, uh, which is um, the, the ascendant impulse that I see in myself and in, in humanity. <clears throat> And that ascendant impulse is toward um, higher organization and harmony uh, into greater and greater clarity um, so that uh, the self can be realized and, and can fuse into the stream of the uh, descendant ray of creation. And so, um, so what, it, what is the opposite of that? It is, to me, it is the shadow. It's, 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 the, the, it's, it's an etheric substance almost of the psyche, which, which contains and blocks um, the light of full sentience of full consciousness. And that comes in, in various, various um, uh, packaging, right? Um, such as cultural and personal artifacts, as well as the biological imperatives and the patterns necessary in, uh, in this material realm for us to, to um, become a something and then drop that something so that we can become a nothing from the egoic perspective, but a much greater allness. And so it's a necessary food for, for spirit or the soul. Um, and I'm, I'm going to freely use these kind of these words here. Um, so yeah, that's, that would be it. So the title of this talk is technocracy and synthetic shadow culture and um, I'm wondering, Lubo, do you think that we are headed for a technocracy? Are we already in a technocracy? And what does that have to do with shadow? Yeah, thanks. So I'll, I'll address a few of those points, which are all very interesting. Uh, I think there's the potential to be headed into a technocracy. We are all in, always in the present moment, and we are either participating in the narratives that are being, uh, in, 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 uh, we are being inspired by, from the outside and we're automatically going along with or we are creating our own so what we're inspired by right now from the outside um or really coerced into it's not an inspiration but it's a coercion into is what i see as technocracy i don't think it's inevitable uh but uh, to to the second part of your question are we already in a technocracy um we are in the nascent form of technocracy but we are in i think we are in an inner 
technocratic state, which is already primed for the outer technocracy for us to walk into that, into that. And what I mean by that is the, um, the, the many scripts that we already run, again, formative and cultural, um, have, have come to such a place within our psyche, within our collective psyche, they're so dense and mechanical that now they're ripe to be externalized into the outer culture. And so that we are, our consciousness gets literally oppressed by an outer mechanical force. And I think we're collectively creating this. And of course, the, the right people are moving into positions to, to uh, basically fulfill that which we're asking unconsciously for, what we're giving power to. Luba, in what ways do you think the technology we're using is feeding off this element of collective shadow and amplifying its contents? I'm not hearing any audio from Lubo. Is that oh, just me? Sorry, no, it is. It was me. Sorry, uh, I muted myself. Okay. Cool. Thank okay. you. Um, so it is the the less and le less aliveness and vitality within our culture, within our bodies, within our communication uh, with each other, the standardization of of human beings, of characters, of personalities, the uh, cultural synthetic archetypes of, of being that are presented as available modes of, 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 of humanity and, and of, of being a human being and a human personality. Um, the, uh, the loss of willpower, the seeking of comfort and uh, convenience basically uh, plug us directly into that which will give us comfort, will solve problems for us, which of course is necessary uh, to a great degree but also uh, it creates a certain laziness and it zaps and siphons and sucks the willpower out of us. And uh, without will, we can't imprint ourselves onto reality. We can't show up as sentient beings of agency and technology, um, some te technology used unconsciously. So I'm, I'm being, um, I, I, I should really be more clear about that. Technology used unconsciously then uh, readily puts us in and siphons us into a whole bunch of um, predictable and closed loops, essentially. So um, do you think the culture um, of our society is suffering due to this technology and is a kind of hollow or um, trivial or sort of pornographic culture emerging instead. Um, you threw out this term synthetic shadow culture. We, we kind of honed in on that, focused on that maybe a little too much, but uh, mm -hmm. what is synthetic shadow culture in your mind? And what, what is the sort of maybe internet culture or the tech culture or this kind of crippled hollow culture that might be emerging instead of an organic human culture? Yeah, well, I think, so I do think that um, Technology is an extension of us and it's an extension of our psyche. And uh, I'm not gonna go into this, but you know, the engineers, the software engineers and others of these technological uh, worlds that we're entering, uh, in a way, those are reflections of their psyche that we're entering. So um, human, so consciously used and consciously participated in technology can actually be a liberating force and it already is, and we all know this, but um, the synthetic aspect of it comes in when we don't have an, as a culture, we've lost, obviously, contact and knowingness and an understanding with the sacred. If we don't have the sacred within our um, radar and within our knowing, with that, within our understanding and mostly within our being, then we are blindly just fulfilling all sorts of prompts, cultural prompts. And so um, instead of finding something from our common folk wisdom uh, from nature and the immense flow and wisdom of this um, mystery, instead of tapping into this open mystery, we tap into a closed human um, labyrinth. And it may, it may at times seem extremely profound and, and it may be, 
but uh, most often it taps into the lower impulses of our humanity. And the lower impulses are just so tasty and delicious to the uh, lower, lower self that they often hijack uh, a culture that doesn't have a hierarchical ascendant path and a model for unfolding oneself. And so um, I, think I, I think I lost myself within all those words, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> So I feel like in some ways we could view um, the 60s, let's say, as sort of a breaking free of a lot of the structure or a lot of the uh, restraints on culture that maybe were in place in the 50s or before the war. Um, do you think a lot of those structures, a lot of those constraints that might have been on us were important for this notion of sacredness? of providing a structure where we can actually kind of um, uh, be in touch with this open mystery and ascend? Uh, and do you see sort of the move from the 60s onward as being kind of a negative thing or was it a very positive thing that's maybe gone too far now? How do you view the timeline, I guess, of the last you know, 50, 60, 70 years? Mm, yeah, um, I, so I think, I think there was something exploded and something happened in the 60s culturally for sure and some of it was manufactured and there's you know there's always parapolitical things that one can delve into but if we look at just the psychological aspects of it there was a breaking free of something and and when those breaking a breaking out of energy when it's not disciplined within much within a mature container with elders and the mature cultural structure it goes way off and becomes an aberrant force of destruction and in this case it became uh, you know, hedonistic in many ways, in the way that I see it, but it opened up many portals for many other beautiful things, a lot of the, um, uh, you know, self help or path on toward self inquiry, and, and other, other paths that were really lost within the West, uh, up until the advent of uh, psych psychology, I guess, in the early 20th century, but I'm, I mean, I'm no historian of this, but um, yeah, I think it just basically ran off and it's we're picking up some of the pieces right now in a more mature way, I think, for some of us. And others are just caught in the cycle and chaos of, of sensual um, exploitation. If we could look at technology and what's developed as this extension of human psyche, do you think that the sacred and the divine and even organic human culture can be found in the technological space? Um, are we grappling with that right now? Or is it just too far gone from our natural culture to really cultivate that? Yeah, great question. I think it can totally be grasped and totally used and it has to be. And that's the way forward. Uh, it's just that it takes individuals and human beings who are looking for the real at all times uh, within themselves, uh, not lying to ourselves, not seeking um, egoic gratification. And this is a difficult task, especially for the younger ones of us who are caught up in the web of uh, being, um, econ being units in a social economic system uh, of trading, um, trading, upgrading their image of all of our images, upgrading our images and trading it and using that as currency. And so um, it is, if we use Rudolf Steiner, he's an Austrian uh, scientist and a mystic. He, he spoke um, rarely, but he spoke about the, the, the clash we, we will have in the future between technology and ourselves. And we will either be enslaved by it um, as an unconscious force, or we will use it ethically and learn to use it ethically. So uh, we can use it ethically, and I think it will be a great aid and a great extension of our soul outward, but in a felt, understood, and in a way that, that will enrich the human experience as, as, as opposed to really just enslave it and, and exploit it. Do you see the session that we're having now, and maybe the stoa and something kind of like this as being evidence of dystopia, or do you see it as evidence of utopia? Is, is the kind of contact that you and I are having in this moment um, sort of a bad thing? Is it weird? Like, or is it actually this gateway maybe to an ascendant um, spiritual way of being? How do you, how do you view this? Mm. Well, given the circumstances and given that we don't live in the same um, geographical place, I'm very grateful that we can do this because then I wouldn't be 
I would not have the opportunity to speak to both of you and everyone else. So that's, it's wonderful. And I mean that truly. Um, but also I would rather, much rather be having this conversation in person. There's something that happens in a physical communion where um, there, there's just something deeper and something perhaps truer. And, and the, the synergy that, that occurs there is, um, I believe that something else occurs, but I, I don't doubt that that occurs on this digital fire, you know, fireplace as well. Um, it, it's true, it does. Um, so it's, I think, again, used as a tool consciously here for, for good, for expansion, for truth, for seeking reality. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, but I would just invite anyone, you know, who's not doing it to participate in a real fleshy interactions uh, with dirty air and, and earth and supposedly dirty things around and messy and, you know, but yeah. So this kind of touches upon um, this aspect of the internet, which is a sort of disembodying, right? And we have, um, we have virtual sort of selves. We have like screen names that aren't our real names. We have avatars that aren't our real bodies. We have, um, you know, profile pictures we might put up that aren't even, they're not us. Uh, and all of this is sort of this disembodying uh, in favor of the ego, right? Almost like who we are on the internet is like the ego playing with itself almost, like it's projecting its own version of who we are. And how much do you think that plays a role in sort of the, the shadow side of the internet, of this, this loss of body and maximizing of the ego? Oh, big time. It's like consciousness being uploaded to the cloud. It's like soul being lost. You know, I'm, I'm actually working on some stories right now and um, just seeing a lot of analogies between the soul loss and, and uh, fracturing of the soul and the internet and the digital space used unconsciously as it taps into the lower self. And a very true, the egoic structure loves the avatars that are created online. And they're really a direct copy and a logical extension of that which we have not faced and clarified within our regular, quote unquote, regular walking, walking life. Uh, so we could make an argument, you know, that we are living in a simulation already within that simulation, we have, uh, we already have an avatar and that's, you know, I'm in my avatar with my personality and, and that the way that I interface with everyone uh, through it and with all of the certain uh, misunderstandings and, and corruptions of, uh, of data that are coming through me, all of my personal lenses, that's basically that is then put onto the internet. It's an already, it's a human dynamic that already exists. So we're super familiar with it. And when it's put onto the internet or onto this public space, into this yeah, digital public space, then it, uh, it gets turbocharged with, uh, it's like it becomes even hyper, hyper whatever, of whatever version it already was. Do you believe there's any way that online community, communities can create these um, kind of more explorative and grounded containers for individuals to look at their shadow, to show up more authentically? You know, we're all going to use the internet ultimately. So how can we use it more responsibly? Well, I think if it's tampered with real life, with earth, with groundedness, with feeling the body, and, and feeling the earth, feeling the elements and having contact with them, knowing them, knowing other human beings uh, with, with dance, with sweat, with activity, with touch, with, with speech, with uh, fully being with the body, not of the body. Uh, but I think the greater danger is not so much the internet, it's, it's what is coming. And this is the, what is coming as in, what is proposed as a, as a potential path forward. And that is the, um, the complete commodification of human beings with human uh, capital markets and, and humans being, and this is a, again, a very, very interesting topic, which is really being imposed onto our culture. Uh, it's expedited right now. And it's not so much the internet and the way that us um, regular folk communicate. I think it's more this imposition by a, a certain degenerative force that seeks to subsume consciousness in a standardized manner and then um, 
incentivize it to act in certain ways for credit scores and and cryptocurrencies and and and, and a blockchain way of uh, limiting and incentivizing limiting certain virtuous behaviors uh, of an ascendant path and incentivizing this de degenerative patterns. Uh, so I think that's the real danger. Would you say that part of the problem here is that technology is outpacing our capacity to develop wisdom to keep up with it? Like if somehow the rate at which we're um, complexifying this this digital realm, if if somehow our wisdom or our sense making could keep up with that, that everything would be great and like technology would just solve things and people would, uh, you know, find themselves behaving virtuously and ascending in some sense. Uh, do you feel like the real problem is that our wisdom just cannot keep up? Yeah, I think the it it's you could say it's a problem that it hasn't been keeping up, but that's the cosmic imperative right now, right? So with the right amount of pressure, you have to meet it with equal, let's say force. Uh, and in this case, it's not force, but it's a move. It's a, you could just do a judo throw and, and use that momentum. But it, ultimately we have to meet that which is in front of us with an equal upgrade. We have to organize ourselves at a higher level internally and then as a community. So that means individuating fully, then letting go of the, that which has individuated and tapping into the greater. And you know that's we can leave that mystery for now because that's a, it's a whole other topic. But yeah, it's a great, great opportunity. I don't think this is just happening as some sort of byproduct of, of mechanical humanity. I, I actually do see the mythological structure of this whole tale. Uh, and those who don't see it are just not playing the game to, to its full capacity, unfortunately. Because if you see it, then you have to act, behave, think in a certain way to meet it so that you don't get subsumed by its unconscious current. What a beautiful time. What a beautiful adventure. And, you know, these are the conversations I think we should be having to see how to do that, which we are already and you guys are doing that. Yeah. Do you believe that technology, the internet, has helped amplify the shadow in a way that's making us see it more clearly, or at least certain elements of it more clearly than before? And uh, if so, you know, do you kind of have your finger on the pulse of any of those particular threads of the shadow that are really emerging right now? Mm, good question. I'm not sure about the latter part of what you said. I feel like that may be somewhere within my understanding, but it's not immediately coming up. But yeah, I do agree with you that uh, it has amplified the shadow much more. Uh, thankfully, it has externalized it uh, and it has literalized it so that we can see it. And that's, I think, the gift of this dynamic that, that Jung brought up to, to our modern eyes. Um, and yeah, because it's very difficult to disentangle the psychological soul and other forces within us. Um, and here we have this black mirror, right? The screen that I'm looking at right now is, is a mirror, a lot of of my psyche the internet shows me that which i seek in, in some sort of weird convoluted way um at all times so yeah i'm yeah i'm sorry i can't think of anything in regards to your second question um do you think that it's useful to blame people or individuals for this trend let's say like does it make sense to blame Mark Zuckerberg? Um, or is it more accurate to say that this is some sort of like meta organism acting on its own? Technology and culture kind of evolves on its own. It's not even clear that it really cares about us. And it's not clear that the people who appear to be in control of it are actually in control as much as they're just sort of in the right place at the right time. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's a both end. And that's not a cop out of an answer. It's because there are bad players. There are bad actors. And you can make a, you can justify that. You can make a, 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 a legitimate case based on actual data. Uh, but that doesn't tell us much. So, and blame, of course, doesn't get us anywhere because we don't learn anything. Uh, and also it's like when, when a virus enters your body, um, you know, if we go down with like viral theory, et cetera, if something um, makes you sick, do you blame that thing that made you sick or do you take responsibility for your immune system? And perhaps that you had an all nighter drug binge for a week. And, you know, like it's there are reasons why Mark Zuckerberg 
Uh, and, you know, he's not really, she don't want to go down the parapolitical pipe, but, uh, you know, him and the others, <laughs> um, they're, they're just, they're, they are also mirrors of what we need to grapple with because there's no comfort and complacency and uh, certainty within the human condition, I don't think. The only real certainty and rest is when, within the infinite. And that really is reached by letting go of all certainty. Um, and so, yeah, I, don't, I think it's a both end. We are participants in a universal drama. We can certainly point to these characters because they then untie the knot and make sense of things for people. And you can see that there are certain interests and forces that are moving in a, in a direction that is giving us exactly what we need as a collective and individual consciousness growing. So Alyssa and I were born like in the late eighties and we might have been the last generation that's not like a digital native, you might say. Um, what is being a digital native or, you know, people who were born after the internet was already a thing and they're just growing up sort of embedded into the internet. Uh, it's around them all the time. They're using it from a very young age. Uh, what kind of effect do you think the internet and technology is going to have on the human, the soul, the psyche for someone who just is in it? They don't even have a choice. They're just raised on the internet. Is that a pretty bleak thing that's going to happen in the future or could it actually be a blessing Mm. How, how do you do it? I wonder, right? Like I, with my limited understanding of that, because I'm not one, you know, I was born in 1982. So just a bit before you guys. And I, I don't know, but I imagine that um, it's like the internet is this extension of the brain and the mind. And I think the head, uh, I, I may be wrong, but right now I don't see it as an extension of the, the body really, maybe of the nervous system, but the felt sense of the heart I don't see that it's not it's not a, a part of my experience on the internet it can prompt some experiences in the heart but it's not the heart it's not the stomach it's not the solar plexus uh it may be it's the degenerate part of the sexual center for sure and that's like siphon like really in a really significant way um yeah i don't know it, it'd be great to speak to uh, you know one of the younger people who is was really deeply into this. Okay, last question for me before we move to Q and A. Um, how has the shadow uh, interacted with your journey as an artist? Do you, do you see this as something that you were in touch with from a very young age? This notion that there's things below the surface that we're not talking about, that we're not paying attention to, and has that kind of driven you to want to bring that to light through your art? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has definitely. So the shadow has bullied and oppressed me my whole life. <laughs> so, and so and, and drowning and, and feeling it's the pain that it brought upon me, I, uh, I, I decided to wrestle with it. And I think that's probably the, the story for many of us. Uh, instead of making excuses for it, instead of justifying it, instead of um, you know, complying with it, both the collective and the individual shadow, I like, again, many of us, I think on this, in this digital space have um, learned from it. And so I started, you could see it as a, as a, as a it's, it was fertile. It's kind of like, I don't know if I said this the last time I spoke to Aaron, but it's kind of like food for real consciousness. And so it's, it's the substance which we need to process and untangle the life force and it's dense, um, forgotten, and, and mismanaged uh, way, untangle it, understand it, see it, love it, integrate it, be, have it become a part of us because nothing is, it, it's not really something to be severed and cut and it can't be. Um, it has to be seen, cared for, tended to, listened to, even, even as it like seethes in horror or vengeance or anger or pain. And so, by consuming it and digesting it and metabolizing the shadow, the individual and culture, cultural shadow, we then gain all of the lessons that it has kept from us. And it's not just the lesson that of its putrefied, the lessons within its putrefied state are there, but it's more the, the lessons of 
unifying the polarity between that which sees the light of consciousness with love um, and that which is way into the darkness and doesn't know the light of consciousness and love. And in fact, our love is required, uh, our higher self is required to come in and be a steward and be a parent to the shadow so that it can open itself and show itself. We're not rejecting it. We're not beating it out of existence. We are inviting it. And to do that, we have to be more mature, more whole. We have to be greater and greater in, in a way that's more encompassing of all that we see that we have not seen. If, if, if existence is, a, is, a, is an illumination of the whole and returning to some sort of source, then we must, we are in a way, the eyes and the senses of this intelligence extended into the shadow realm, claiming it all back by seeing it and inviting it back into the dance and bringing it home. So yeah, as an artist, I guess that's, it's been that wrestling that is, is constantly stimulating me. Thank you, Lubo. So we're going to move on to the audience Q&A portion of this event. So everyone feel free to turn your cameras back on. And just FYI, we probably won't get through all the questions depending on how many come in, uh, but please drop them in the chat, mark it with a Q, and we likely won't go in order. But to start things off, Charles, did you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, yeah. Um... Reading Heidegger alerted me to the, the problem of techni, the world of techni, um, which pulls us out of time, natural time, and pulls us into, out of the sacred and into tool space. And we then live in tool space and become dominated by tool space. So I'm a technologist, I love technology, but I, I need the sacred. So how can I keep myself in the sacred and still be part of technique, part of tool space? Hmm. Yeah, great question. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm fit to answer it uh, fully, but I'll, I'll do my best uh, to just have this conversation with you. Um, well, I would say that it's feeling into a tr what, whatever is the truest part of you as it deepens more and more into a fullness and opens up. So what, what is that place? Well, we know what that place is not. And that place is not the judgments about our situation in the moment. And it's not about our des desires and the repetitive behavioral patterns that we're used to. Is there a sense of self here now that is beyond that? And can we, from that place, use technology and use tools for, for a purpose that comes from there. So all I'm really saying is, can we go to a place of clarity beyond, uh, beyond pattern behaviors and, and deal with clarity as opposed to from all of our habitual must do, need to, need to do, et cetera. Any follow up, Charles? Yeah, I think the, the problem is um, paying attention to this. I agree with you that if we, if we become conscious and uh, grow as individuals, we can learn to direct our use of tool space in a way that um, moves us towards consciousness. Uh, but it's so easy to lose attention and to lose focus and just to fall into it um, and I'm sort of building my own individual way of coping with this, but it seems to me it would be helpful if more people like, well, like what you're talking about today, how we work our way back to consciousness and to the sacred while still working with technology. Mm. Uh, but I feel kind of solitary in this situation so it's nice to run into you mm. because you understand it mm. 
Thank you, Charles. All right. Uh, let's see, Josh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, I'm going to resend my question because I feel like it was answered quite well in the closing statement. So. You have another question you want to ask? Um, probably, but it hasn't come to me yet. So. <laughs> All right. Feel free to enter it in the chat if it comes up. All right. Uh, instead, let's see. How about, um, let's see, David has a question that he wants me to read for him. So I'm going to do that. Uh, do you have any advice for becoming an artist in the current climate? It feels like the traditional routes have been captured by the culture wars. Um, concrete advice for po possible alternative tracks would be much appreciated. Thank you. God, I, yeah, I really wish I could say something useful in a way that's practical and applicable. Um, I can only speak to my certain path that, and the way that it's shaped up. I think the main you know, uh, so instead of giving you like practical, actionable things that are within material reality, I would just say what's most important. And I actually think this is the most, but it's the vital part. If you anchor that, then everything else will shape up somehow mysteriously. It, it does. It just does. If you are a protector of your vision and if you have a vision and that vision can change and morph, but if you feel it, if you deeply feel it and you communicate with that vision and you you ask to, to, to be, in, you know what, however this comes off, like I would say, be, be asked for guidance with your vision. The more faith and, and, and belief and understanding you have of it, uh, the more pathways will be shown to you. It just, it, that's just how it works. And um, then all you need to worry about is your craft and your virtuous and, and conduct with other human beings so that your, your vision then starts being infused into the structures of media and communication that we've established in the physical realm. So be a guardian of your vision and a gardener of it, tend to it. And that's what I can say. Luba, I wanted to uh, ask a follow-up question on art and technology, because I think what's been interesting about the digital space is how much uh, power and autonomy it's given artists to put their art out there in non-traditional ways uh, with, like in shadow has become this incredible hit I think it has like millions of YouTube views and so there is this interesting atmosphere and frontier that the internet has created and I'm curious if you could just speak to the potentials that uh, the digital space offers artists that we never could have considered decades ago yeah it's excellent right it's the dem democratization of communication of expression and of course that can turn into shrieking and madness since everyone speaks now and that's cool uh, but it can also mean that many of us who are just lost in the suburbs or in the urban jungles and our basements and, and other dwellings can now just you know put in a digital um, communication signal out there and can be seen so the ease of access the ease of, of creating content is is absolutely beautiful and i think it's on par with the things we need to um to to contend with the oppressive forces that are again seeking to awaken us to a higher order of being and so the tools are in our hands we just have to use them with discipline and vision um and and yeah it's just art art what a what a wonderful thing, because the way that I see it, it's, and I, I, was, I was very inspired by Paul Levy, who, uh, when I was making In Shadow, and I was in the thick of it, you know, with, with my doubts and, and ironing out certain parts of it not working, and, you know, just the, the creative turmoil that comes with any project. I was reading Paul Levy, and, and he really inspired me by, by saying that the shamanic artistic impulse to go into the unknown and, and battle battle the inner and outer, battle the, battle the inner and collective darkness uh, to contend with it, to shine a light on it, to learn about it, and then to use one's craft and bring it out into the culture and, 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 and make it known and thus process a little bit of the collective shadow. I think it's such, a, such an inspiring uh, path for, for artists. It certainly inspired me. So I, I'd like to just put that out there. Any of the, the more warrior-like uh, artists 
get you know feel any nourishment or need any nourishment like let that be your nourishment it's a it's it can be a warrior discipline a magical warrior discipline all right so i'm going to read a question on behalf of simona she says can you expand on how technology embodies the consciousness of those who produce it like software engineers and developers and how this can influence people who then use that technology yeah, thanks for that question. So, uh, you know, this actually came to me the other night. I started thinking about this conversation and I, you know, I, I'm, I'd, I'd love for you guys to, if you have any thoughts on it, but uh, started seeing that, um, you know, I'll use very basic terms, terminology, because this can get so complex as far as like the digital space and these, uh, let, let's just say a program, a program created by a software engineer could be an extension of the way that an extension of the psyche of that engineer and the way that they experience reality, their particular traumatic or wounded uh, experiences, or their natural talents that 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 lead them toward a certain way of seeing reality. Now, if that program, and again, I'm being very simple, simplistic here, if that program then that be, gets installed within the cultural landscape, it organizes human culture and human conduct, and therefore human reality according to the echoes of that human psyche or of a group psyche within a certain company culture, right? And a company culture can easily be led and incentivized to turn into a certain type of culture that's led by, again, an unconscious or a conscious impulse by other humans or a human. So um, if a, a person is not, has not gone through the work of introspection of deep unraveling of who they are and doesn't come into it with a generative goodwill, then they will, I think, almost inevitably create something that will create a degenerative attractor and will be actually much more um, damaging to society. So even if it's something that feels like it's organizing the world and making it more convenient and much better, it could really be standardizing it, making it all the same and really enslaving it to uh, patterns devoid of, you know, of spirit. I'm just going to uh, contribute some of my own thoughts on this because I think it's an interesting question. Um, I think something kind of the, the other side of this, I think it's important to acknowledge is that uh, a lot of the danger here is that um, the technology is just sort of working uh, with a mind of its own. Like it's just trying to fill niches. If something can make money, inevitably engineers are going to find out what that is. And that's part of the problem is like Facebook, for instance, makes a huge amount of money. It's like, it's been more successful than like any company in history or something like that. Uh, but is it good for us? It's not clear. And so part of the problem is that what I see is that not necessarily that engineers are kind of crafting something and they don't know what they're doing and their shadow contents are coming into what they're crafting. I think that's part of it. But also I think that we are developing tech that feeds off shadow contents and amplifies it. And there's no morality in that. It just makes money. So it like almost naturally emerges on its own. And that's part of the problem. And that's part of the, you know, the capitalist problem too, is uh, things that make money will just evolve. And it doesn't, it's not clear whether it's good for us. It doesn't matter if it's good for us, it makes money. And that's part of the problem with tech is that it's found a way to feed off of uh, some of our, uh, our biggest vices purely because it's profitable. And, um, who's choosing that who's deciding that it's almost like nature is sort of deciding it on its own and that's mm. sort of the big problem is like how do you fight against nature um it requires wisdom it requires agency it requires organization it requires rigorous morality as a culture but we don't have that and that's mm. a huge part of the problem i say totally it's like yeah we're using this capitalist currency as opposed to being in the divine current <laughs> so it's like I think that our, our yeah our currency itself what is what is considered currency and what is considered capital in itself I think is going to be up for questioning and, and reinterpretation in the coming decades. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see another question from the audience. This is from uh, Therese. I'm going to read it for her. Um, how do you view the transcendent? Do you think we are losing our ability for transcendence in a technocratic world? Yeah, I do think we're losing our ability to uh, for transcendence. That's 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 basically, I think, the biggest point I would like to make. That 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 is it. 
Um, so if we, those of us who allow ourselves to enter into a social credit system of virtual reality of augmented reality, and we have mixed reality now and Microsoft is developing certain meeting rooms and other stuff like that. It's just a slow, slow uh, descent into that. If we allow ourselves to do that and to act according to all of the incentives that are being put out by the technocratic engineers, then we, uh, we succumb to being in dense loops of prompts of uh, prefabricated uh, definitions of, of reality, of occurrences, of, and we match our ego structure according to those things. And so uh, we cannot be within that which is beyond the transcendent other if we are stuck within this dense realm. And you could definitely make uh, very strong allegories between the satanic realm and the satanic as a mythological structure of bondage of the devil of tempting away from light uh, to be in the in the darkness of the finite materialistic digital etheric electric realm um so yeah big big dangers there for those who are so so attuned uh but really no danger for those who are on the, on the path because i i think once you know yourself and uh once we choose to not comply with any of the offers, with on any of the implicit contracts that are culturally and socially being made with us, uh, we can have complete soul and psychic um, hygiene. And that is entirely up to us because if we keep saying, well, it's no use, it's just you kind of have to do it, well, that's a choice. It may be very difficult to choose to not comply, but there are some difficult choices ahead of those of us who want to grow and be fully realized. Uh, Lubo, I feel you're touching on this question from the audience already, but it might be nice to expand on it. Uh, Johnny Blue, do you wanna unmute and ans ask your question? Um, yes, thanks um, Lubo um, for this last, because yes, my question does um, relate to that. And I think that's indeed, um, a hopeful perspective and so i'm i'm actually imagining and thinking about a uh, digital personhood and how you can you, so you speak of the introspective work work you need to do to become this sovereign ag agent and i think if you can couple that to um um a digital individuation as well and to form a certain um so I, I i my my question arises from a decentralized so kind of blockchain but decentralized uh cubed identity on on it's, it's very very abstract my question but um so i'll just read it out because what well, that's that's how uh, probably best to do it now because i'm i'm um new to this online presence and being on the spot like this um so my question is, although you are not a Jungian, I feel that you will have become acquainted with the individuation process. And can you imagine a digital individuation process? Do you have thoughts on digital personhood? Can we as pre-millennials midwife a model for a digital ID personality that will be protected from the major forces that are already threatening our real life personalities? Sorry, can you just uh, repeat the last sentence? So, um, can we as pre-millennials midwife a model for a digital ID slash personality that will be protect that will protect us from the major forces that are already threatening our real life personalities? Yeah, cool. Well, Johnny, thanks. Thanks for that question, man. Um, so I'll, I'll just respond to what feels freshest from because I feel like there was a lot, but um, it's a good question. What a good question. So I think people are, and I've been in touch with certain people that are working on actually being uh, in charge of your own metadata and, and creating your own online persona and like being in charge of all that. And my view right now is that that's very easily hijacked already. Because again, if we keep coming back to who we are right now here, what is that thing? That is the organizational, uh, that's where all the organization of our consciousness and our, all of our activities begins. And so if we start curating this, even if it's 
well intended. If we start curating this online personality, it can easily slip back into a sort of Facebook, Instagram persona, you know, be, which then has to compete with the others. Um, I, I would I would just pull back fully and be like, there is no competition. There is no hierarchy as far as uh, other human beings. There is the being here and the unfolding mystery. And I know that may be too abstract. But I feel like I just want to pull all the way back to what is real from the real and the unreal. And then we can start seeing, you know, the models. But if it's a necessary tool for us to have an online presence and somehow have sovereignty there, then um, I think I'm getting lost maybe in all these, these concepts. But I think there is models like that are being worked on by, by people I don't really have right now anything to say about it. I think it's a great idea. But my caveat is be very careful of your the true intentions and their origin because that's where everything else projects out from and goes into maybe maybe i can rephrase it just slightly sure. let's say you were go were to go on a retreat for six months you would be trained to develop you know with in, 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 a variety of skills uh, psychotechnologies you would become, um, you know, it would be like a fast track individuation process because you'd already done prior work. And then you'd, let's say as a, as a diploma, you'd get um, uh, a digital identity, which would be decentralized off the grid. And that, you know, and that would actually be uh, your sovereign agent on the decentralized platform. And you could slowly, let's say, as be pioneering in this, you know, space and and you know start to i guess re-engineer that decentralized space as a sovereign agent individuated does that make well I, I don't yeah i you know it doesn't make sense to me maybe i'm just not understanding it only because i think a, a digital identity is already separate from the i-ness of the now true unfold itself so it's i'm not sure how that can individuate it can individuate as in relation perhaps to the ecosystem that it's part of but it's already separate from me and it's not me so i don't i don't know i don't know what i, I can't quite grok the purpose of it other than if it's an economic need of some sort to to interface with the workplace or i don't know but i think on yeah yeah th thanks thanks for that johnny i think it's worth exploring more but i appreciate it yeah thanks johnny thanks we're gonna move on to uh we want to Josh to give him another chance to ask his question. That'll probably be the last one. Sure, yeah, a different question this time. Um, sort of related to the nowness that you were, were just mentioning, but also um, from, I guess, the sense-making perspective, how important is having that embodiment to, um, I guess, escaping, escaping the trappings of, of the, the shadow that we were talking about and more verbatim, do you think that what ends up in the online collective shadow finds its way there because it's lacking a somatic component um, and would a web that's grounded in more bodily feedback, i.e. haptics or augmented reality be a good thing or would this only kind of add to the problem? Do you think that we can ground our, our internet presence in reality by, by adding Soma to the um, more abstract psyche elements of, of online presence. Yeah, I do definitely think that. And just, you know, speaking, um, communicating online, having these conversations, I've been trying to feel my body during this whole time and feel my feet on the floor uh, as my energy and my consciousness has been trying to go up into my head. And the more in tune I've been with my body and with my feet on the floor, the more truthful I have been with, with what's coming. And I think that's one way that we could do it is to be completely responsible and in charge of where we are right now, as then we uh, transport our consciousness into the virtual realm as a proxy of ourselves. So that if we just send the proxy with all of its memories and memorize the catchphrases and theories and like sexy frameworks that work with some people and are you know popular with others, if we just go with that, then all we're going to do is 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 repeat and and uh, repeat and 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 uh, filter the conversations uh, through that lens. And the more embodied we are here now, feeling the body, and you know the process of feeling the body and knowing the body and saturating it with awareness and consciousness, 
requires that we face all the parts that are numb and unconscious in it, that hurt and are painful. Um, just try doing a standing meditation for five minutes and see how that feels relaxing your body. You start wanting to run because of, of, of all the shame and guilt that starts coming up and saying, this is worthless, don't do it. So while doing that, we start humbling ourselves and start clearing away the importance of the psyche, the self-importance of the psyche of the ego. And when we're in touch with the body and in the flow and the, the cascading sensations of reality as it's happening right now, we can enter into a conversation and not be stuck in constantly trying to validate ourselves or, or seek to pull validation from others. So uh, bottom line is we show up in a truer way, in a more humble way. And when we do that, uh, the, the darker aspects of shadow culture can't pull and tug on us it can't hook into us because the body is free and open there's nothing to be hooked into uh, so that's I think that's that's what i can say about that so Bamir, do you have any uh closing statements that you want to give out on this topic before we uh end the session hmm. um <laughs> i should go through my notes but there's no time for that um, yeah, I would just say here's, yeah, I think I would close on this. I, here's my view on the ascendant impulse and the descendant pull. In the end, ascendant impulse toward, um, greater harmony and, and, uh, opening and unfolding to this mystery is present within all of us. And there's great pain and turmoil when we block that. And we are when we are on the wrong path and there's and and then analogous to that there's the the de descendant impulse and sorry i'm going to basically start that again there's a there's a there's an imperative for us to unify in a in a divine consciousness right and yet at the same time there's a equal pull to be organized and unified into an unconscious unity ai and this digital techno grid is pulling us toward unifying ourselves into a un in an unindividuated, unified, unconscious oneness. And it hijacks the very natural impulse to be unified and organized into an individuated, sovereign unity within the allness. And I would just be very wary and I would caution everyone and put that as a signifier is there are many ways that, that our good impulses are hijacked and, and uh, subverted into a darker and, and something in a darker way that doesn't serve us. So sorry, that was kind of messy. I hope the gist of it was is in there somewhere. So thank you so much, guys, for, for this conversation. Yes, thank you, Lubo, so much. Let's give Lubomir a muted round of applause, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. We'd love to have you on again. A lot of insight in here. I was, uh, I've had a conversation with you before and I thought it was like really awesome and I wanted to talk to you more than anyone else. So I'm glad it got to happen again. Um, anyways, uh, next week will be the final session in the Shadow Play series. We're going to have Michael Mead of the mm -hmm. Living Myth podcast. He's going to come talk to us about uh, ritual and rites of passage and stories that are associated with the shadow. So that's going to be next week wednesday march 17th at 5 p.m eastern time notice the time change it's gonna be at 5 p.m eastern time next week and uh yeah we hope to see you there and if you'd like to check out mine and Alyssa's work you can follow us at goldenshadow.org so thank you guys so much for joining us and we will see you next time